My name is Steve Souders. I'm the Chief Performance Yahoo. And I'm going to reprise this talk that I did at OzCon about a month ago, High Performance Websites. Uh, so I work on the Exceptional Performance Team at Yahoo. And our charter is really simple. We want to quantify and improve the performance of all Yahoo products worldwide. Uh, we're kind of a center of expertise within the company. Yahoo's very cool. That way they have the resources to pick areas that they see are important to the future of the company and dedicate a group of people to focus on that full time and really do a deep dive and find what are the best practices that we can leverage across all of Yahoo's teams in this area. So our area is performance, web performance. So we build tools, we analyze a lot of data, uh, and we also focus on these best practices, trying to uh, find these best practices. If they're some of the best practices we find by going out and working with teams, others we find by we just think that there's an area uh, by looking at the spec or what we notice about pages loading that we can research and find best practices that maybe no one else has found yet. So we do a lot of research and once we have these best practices we evangelize and we go out and we try to sell them to the company. So I started this group about three years ago and uh, when I was asked to improve the performance of Yahoo products, I assumed this was going to be what I'd been focusing on most of my career, back-end performance. So looking at uh, compiler options and database uh, schemas and indexes and sh caches and shared memory and things like that. But I did something that I had never done before and I felt embarrassed that I had never done this before. I said, okay, well, so the performance we're really going to try to optimize is from the end user's perspective. So let me measure from the end user's perspective how our products perform. And when I did that, I found out something very surprising. Uh, so what this is, this is a picture of the HTTP packets over time of www.yahoo.com with an empty cache. And what we see here is only 5% of the end user response time is spent getting the HTML document back. So this includes not just the time for Apache to stitch together the page and pull together all the information it needs, but also the time for the request to go up and the response to come back. So all of that was only 5% of the user experience. The other 95% was what I call front end. It's really not front end per se. What I really mean is everything after the HTML document has arrived back on the browser, but I call that front end. It's a little easier to say. So the other 95% is spent on requesting all this other stuff, uh, parsing CSS and JavaScript, executing the JavaScript, doing DOM manipulation, rendering the page. So when I saw this, I thought, okay, well, this must be atypical because most of my career, when I've wanted to make a web page faster, I focused on the back end performance. So maybe this is just www.yahoo.com with an empty cache. What's it like with a full cache? So even with a full cache, a prime cache, where all the cacheable components are already in the browser, still the back end time, the time to get the HTML document down, was only 12%. There's a white gap here where nothing's happening. That's where the browser is reading things off disk and parsing and executing CSS and JavaScript. Um, and in this case, there's a few more packets to download, some uh, beacons or ads or something like that. So even here, 88% uh, of the end user response time was spent on this activity after the HTML document has arrived. So I thought, okay, well, this must be something peculiar to f Yahoo front page. But then I went out and I looked at the top 10 uh, websites in the US, and for all of them, except for one, less than 20% of the end user response time is spent getting the HTML document back. And so the one exception is uh, Google with a prime cache. You know, Google's page is so Spartan. In a prime cache, there's only two HTTP requests. So in this case, the uh, HTML document is 36%. But in most cases, and it, this is true of every page I've ever looked at, less than 20% of the end user response time is spent getting the HTML document back. So I don't want to tell back-end engineers they shouldn't continue to focus on making their handlers faster and their databases faster and uh, better caching and memory use. I'm just saying that we need to spend a larger amount of our focus on this other part of the end user experience where maybe we've been lacking focus for the last five years or so. 
Uh, and that's our performance golden rule. 80 to 90 percent of the end user response time is spent on the front end. So if you want to improve the end user experience, that's where you should start. There's three reasons that have been shown by us for why this makes sense. First of all, it's just the raw numbers. In your wildest dreams, if you could cut the back end response time, the back end performance time in half, and which would be a huge job, you could cut 5 to 10 percent off the end user response time. But if you can cut the front end part in half, you can cut 40 to 50 percent off the response time. So just a priori probability, you have the much higher chance of making a major impact on the user experience by focusing on the front end. The other thing is these front end changes are simpler. So like if you want to optimize your C++ code or build a new database or replicate your database across colos worldwide, those are weak, month, multi-month long tasks. Whereas a lot of the front end uh, performance improvements that I'll talk about in a minute are pretty easy. Like they're on the order of hours or maybe days to change some server configuration or to rearrange components in your page. Uh, they're not very difficult to do. So it's easier to make these changes. They have a larger a priori probability of having an impact and they're proven to work. We've done this with lots of teams at Yahoo and we've got, it's pretty easy for us to walk into almost any team and cut 25% off the response time that from the end user's perspective of their pages, uh, how long it takes their pages to load. And also it's cool since we've released this, uh, this stuff externally, I'm getting emails from other companies like Zillow and Amazon where they're having similar savings by adopting some of these rules. And usually there's only three or four rules that are really key to do differently with your site. And they'll make the changes to adopt those three or four rules and cut 25% off. So it's proven to work. So it's good stuff to listen to. So uh, the main thing we've done for the last three years is build this list of best practices. And so we've done this in the format of rules. Now something that's really, and we have 14 rules right now. There's another five or six that are in the works. Um, so one thing I've found is these 14 rules make for a really, really great way to digest the data, but it's really terrible for a talk because most people can track like five to seven things and after that they start nodding off. So uh, you have to hang in through all 14 and I'm gonna go through them really, really quick so it doesn't take too long. Um, but hang in there, it, it's gonna be a little bit long. So I'm just gonna walk through them, maybe one slide for each one, one or two. So, uh, and the rules are in priority order. So the ones that come first are the most important. So. Obviously, the thing that's taken a lot of time uh, that we saw in that HTTP packet uh, chart are the HTTP requests. So if you can reduce the number of HTTP requests, that's awesome. Sometimes this is hard because you start stepping on the toes of designers. If you tell them some of the aesthetic components of a page should be removed, how do, how do you make that trade-off decision? And so what these, these four techniques help you do is not uh, alter the content of the page at all, just do them in a more efficient way. So I'm not going to talk about image maps or inline images. Inline images is a way to actually embed an image or other data in the HTML document itself. It's very cool because there's no HTTP traffic, but it's not supported in IE. And um, image maps are kind of old school. Most people probably know how to do those. Combined scripts, combined style sheets, what that means is don't combine scripts and style sheets together. But if you have like five script files in your page, combine them, just concatenate them and make them one file. And you're going to cut down on the overhead of those four additional HTTP requests. It's huge. The one I am going to talk about, I think, is CSS sprites. So the analogy I make here is it's like a Ouija board um, where you have the little planchette, that's what the thing that all the people hold and they can move it uh, around the Ouija board. So you can take the, basically take all of these separate images that you're using for background images on your page. In this case, this is a uh, CSS sprite from Yahoo front page where they have all these little icons for the different products, Yahoo products. And instead of making the, in this case, it's like 60 images. Instead of making it 60 separate HTTP requests, this is now one HTTP request. And wherever they want to show one of these icons for a product, they can just have some kind of block element, a span or a div, and they can use the background position attribute to position that box over the background image that they care about. And so you get huge savings. Imagine reducing 60 HTTP requests to one HTTP request. It's a uh, tremendous savings. 
Um, and actually, the total size of the data downloaded is also less because each of those separate images has some formatting and color table information in them. So even though you're adding uh, spacing between each of the images, the overall size is reduced typically. Um, so sp CSS sprites are one of the best techniques techniques for reducing the number of HTTP requests. The second rule. Uh, which is easy for us here, is to use a content delivery network. More specifically, a content delivery network that has geographically distributed uh, colos. So here I just did a quick survey of these top 10 US websites again to show which one they're using. The ones that aren't using any probably have their own, or I wasn't able to detect by doing a reverse NS lookup uh, what CDN they're using. Akamai is pretty much the industry standard now. Um, so a really important lesson here is uh, to think about distributing your static content before your business logic or your uh, back-end uh, page generation, generation logic. So it'd be great to distribute both, but taking your back-end architecture and figuring out how to split that across multiple colos worldwide can be pretty daunting, whereas just taking your static content content and pushing it to a bunch of, of edge servers is really, really easy. So make that step first. Add an expires header. This is all about maximizing the use of the browser's cache. If you can do that, if, you can, if the browser can read something from, it, from its cache and avoid the HTTP traffic, that's huge savings. So I just did a quick survey here of, um, like at Yahoo, you know, for at least seven years, We've had a far future expires header on our images, but it wasn't about until about two years ago that we made that the default for our static content for style sheets and scripts. And you can see that um, there's a fair number of these websites that do a far future expires header. They maximize the cacheability of their images, but that drops off when it comes to style sheets and scripts. So we want to make that true for all of these types of static content that we have. Um, and what's interesting is you might look at a site like CNN and say, okay, well, less than 1% of their content has a f is cacheable. Well, maybe that's, you know, CNN, it's news, it's very dynamic content, maybe it's changing a lot. So then what I looked at was uh, what I call the median age. So this is the delta between the last modified header um, that says when was this component, this image in this case, last modified and what's today's date. So that's the age, and, it, and I just took the median age. So like for CNN, there were, what, like 150 components that were cacheable. Well, 50% of those were more than 227 days old. So there's really no argument to be serving this kind of static content that's very, very old, that's not changing very often, and not using the browser's cache. So add a far future expires header, uh, take advantage of the browser's cache. GZIP components, a lot of times uh, I talk to web developers and they say that there's not much they can do to control the response time for users. Yahoo doesn't have a ISP that people can sign on with. And so that's not true. We've seen how the previous rules, the rules yet to come, if you adopt them, you can make the end user experience uh, faster. This is the one that uh, maybe talks most directly to network response time. So you can take a component um, like uh, an HTML page, or even anything else that's text, uh, uh, scripts, style sheets, JSON requests, XML, JSON responses, and you can gzip them. And this will cut uh, about 70% off the size of the data being transferred over the wire. And so you can imagine if you had something that uh, was going to be 70K and now it's only 10K, how many fewer TCP packets that's going to be to get that delivered to the browser. It's going to make a big difference. And gzip is pretty widely supported, even more than 90% now. So gzipping HTML documents is pretty prevalent, at least among these uh, top 10 sites. Um, but what we see is gzipping scripts and style sheets is less popular. And there's no reason you can't do it. Um, it's mostly that uh, you have to take the extra step to configure your web server to turn that on. So you should uh, gzip them. Put style sheets at the top. So uh, this one came from discovering that in Internet Explorer, if you have a, an external style sheet, the browser, i.e., won't render anything in the page until all the style sheets in the page have been downloaded. 
So one property was trying to optimize stuff, and they had a style sheet that wasn't needed unless the user happened to click on something in the page. And they figured, okay, well, let's put that at the very end because we'll get the page rendered and up in front of the user, and then we'll finally download that kind of after onload uh, CSS that we need. Well, it turned out to be the worst thing they could do. They moved it to the bottom, and in IE, it seemed to take 20 seconds to download that page. And this is also one that brings up the point about the difference between user perception and actually what you're measuring. So we have this way of measuring the load time of a page, but what matters more than that is the user's perception of how fast the page loads. So putting your style sheets up at the head might not make the overall load time of the page any faster, but they're going to make that user perception uh, that the page is fast better. And so that's what's really important is how do users perceive your, your page's loading. Um, another kind of uh, small thing we discovered is in Internet Explorer, there's two ways of loading style sheets. You can use the at import uh, command inside a style block, but in Internet Explorer, that will actually download it at the very end of the page, and again, that's going to cause IE to block the rendering uh, of all the content on the page, so use the link tag. Move scripts to the bottom. So this one's pretty controversial. People say, oh, you know, we can't really do it. So first, the problem. The problem with scripts is they block the rendering of anything below them in the page, and they also block parallel downloads. So in HTTP 1.1, you can download two components in parallel per host name. So like if you had five different host names that were used, you could theoretically download 10 components in parallel, 10 images or scripts or whatever. But when the browser, both IE and Firefox, start downloading a script, they won't download anything else until that script has arrived back. So especially if you have a slow script, it's going to impact the loading of everything else in the page. So what you want to do, it's not always possible, but for example, if you had um, some uh, DHTML-like element, like a menu or tree or something, halfway down the page, what you'd want to do is put the .js that was necessary for that right above it. And that way, all the stuff ab above that element in the page, headers and logos and, and static text, could be downloaded and rendered to the user and give them that progressive rendering experience that's going to make the user's perception of load times better. Uh, oh, yeah, and the, the defer attribute is not really a solution to this. Uh, defer is supported only in IE, and actually IE doesn't defer it to the end. It just defers it for a couple components. So eventually in a couple components after your script deferred script uh, tag, you're still going to download the JavaScript file in IE and block everything else. So don't rely on defer to work. Um, IE supports something called CSS expressions. Uh, a lot of times people use it to address uh, CSS incompatibilities across browsers. So for example, uh, so uh, an expression is just a JavaScript expression that IE will uh, execute, and the result of that expression is set as the CSS style. So in this case, here's a way to maybe get around the lack of support for min width in uh, IE. You could say when this expression is evaluated, uh, look at the, uh, the body's width, if it's less than 600 pixels, then um, set it to 600 pixels. Otherwise, set it to auto size. So the problem is CSS expressions are executed many more times than you probably expect. They're executed every time you move the mouse in the page. So if you have this expression, during a typical user interaction with that page, the expression will be executed 10 to 50,000 times. So if you weren't aware of that and you did something a little too heavy in your JavaScript, it could really impact the load time of the page, and we've seen this happen. So there's ways to get around it. If you had a one-time expression, it only had to be evaluated and set once during the life of the page, like setting a background color based on today's date or something like that. You can do one-time expressions where the evaluation of the expression actually overwrites itself. So the expression won't exist anymore, and so it won't be executed when the user moves the mouse around the page. Um, but you could also write an event handler, like in the case of solving min width, rather than do an expression, uh, add an event handler to the resize event. And so that's what makes CSS expressions so easy, is they're tied to events automatically, so you don't have to worry about that. But that's what's bad about them, is they're tied to all the events. So they're going to be executed all the time. So do the heavy lifting yourself. Figure out which events you really need this expression to be evaluated against, and tie it to those events. Um, so there's a 
even earlier question to answer when you start your work is, should you put your JavaScript and CSS inline in the page or in external files? Um, if you put it inline, it makes the HTML document uh, bigger, right? Every time the user loads that page. But it also means there's fewer HTTP requests. And the first rule is to reduce the number of HTTP requests, right? So if you make them external, it's more HTTP requests. But now that, that block of JavaScript or CSS, which could be big, could be cached. So the answer to this one really depends on your page and what the user interaction with your page is like. If your user only comes in once a day and only has one page view, you might want to inline it in the page, right? Because if you make it cacheable, it's really not going to benefit them for the rest of the day. Um, but if it's an application like mail or search or something like that, where they're most likely to have multiple page views, then you could make the components external, make them cacheable, and the uh, subsequent pages will be fast. So external is typically better. Uh, what you could do, uh, some ways to get the best of both worlds, like if you had a front page like Yahoo Mail, is you could inline it, but as soon as the page is done loading in the background, you could start preloading the external components that are going to be used on the next page the user goes to. So you're still inlining it in the page, so that first page is fast, but at least subsequent pages will benefit from having that CSS and JavaScript cached. The other thing you could do is kind of tricky is when you download the components, you could actually set a user cookie. And now when the user goes to, say, the front page of Yahoo Mail, the mail server, if it sees that cookie, the cookie is a strong indicator that those components are in the user's cache. So the backend server could serve that front page and it could serve it referencing those external files. And then it makes the HTML document smaller, so it'll get to the user faster, and those components can be read from disk. Reduce DNS lookups. Uh, mostly this is a placeholder to remind people that DNS lookups don't come free. Uh, it can take sometimes 100 milliseconds or more to do a DNS lookup. While you're doing it, nothing else is being downloaded. Um, and there's uh, not only caches with your ISP, but also on your box. In your operating system and in your browser, there are DNS caches. So web developers should be aware of those. Um, a lot of times, there's not much you can do to reduce the number of domains in your page. What you want to do is look at which domain is being used for very few components, so you're not getting much parallelized uh, downloads from it, and try to combine those components with each other or in other domains that are critical for the page. So kind of get rid of the wasteful uh, DNS lookups in the page. Minify JavaScript. Minification means get rid of the white space. Carriage returns, tabs, spaces, comments, definitely. So what we see is only um, four of these uh, top 10 US websites minify their external JavaScript. But I also wanted to point out, you could minify your inline JavaScript uh, blocks as well. And in fact, this might actually even be easier. If you're using some uh, rendering framework like PHP, you could just have a module that before you insert a script block into the page, you run it through a minifier, and Doug Crockford's JS Min comes in various languages. So you can probably find one that works with your framework. And now all your blocks can be, uh, your inline blocks can be minified as well. Oh, there's another choice of minification, obfuscation, which um, actually munges variable and function names to make them smaller. And it does have greater reduction. So what I did here was I looked at all of the scripts that weren't minified from these uh, six sites that didn't use minification. And I minified them. I also obfuscated them. And so we see overall that if these uh, sites had minified their code, they would have cut 21%. If they had ob obfuscated their, their code, they would have saved 25%. So obfuscation does save an extra 4%, but it's riskier. You could modify uh, and create variable names that are used somewhere else in the global space and have namespace conflict. So I've definitely seen bugs introduced by obfuscation, uh, but not by minification. There's a new uh, obfuscator out there, though, the YUI compressor, that uh, has greater savings than most minifiers and is also a lot safer. So you could check that one out. It's on the YUI page on developer.yahoo.com. Avoid redirects. So again, just a reminder, um, redirects tell the user, oh, you asked for this page, but instead let me send you to this new location. Um, and 
uh, despite their names, redirects aren't cached unless you set the headers to make them cached. So if this is a redirect that's going to be true for a long, long time, set a far future expires header. And I say it's the worst form of blocking because like JavaScript files will block downloads, but at least some of the page could have been downloaded already and started rendering in the browser. But if you have a redirect before the HTML document, nothing is, get, is going yet until that redirect is resolved. So if you're on a slow uh, bandwidth connection somewhere in the middle of the country, this could really, really impact your user experience, degrade your user experience. Remove du duplicate scripts. It sounds silly, but if you have the same .js file in your page more than once, it's going to slow down the user experience. And IE, it could result in extra in two HTTP requests. And no matter whether it results in an extra HTTP request or not, it's going to be executed twice. Sometimes that even introduces bugs. So, uh, you know, this sounds like it wouldn't happen very often. Two out of these top ten websites right now today have, and for the last six months, have had uh, duplicate scripts in their page. So it does happen. So it's not surprising though actually because the larger the number of people on your team, the more likely that there's miscommunications and two people don't know that they've each loaded the same JavaScript module. So for these top 10 sites, they probably have pretty big teams and they're using a lot of JavaScript, um, but you should pay attention to that. Configure e-tags. So e-tags came with HTTP 1.1. It's a more flexible and powerful way of validating that something the browser has cached is actually the latest version or the correct version of that component. Um, the problem is that in the default uh, syntax for Apache and IIS, there's something that's inserted into the e-tag syntax that will not match across web servers. Um, so if you're only using one web server, this isn't an issue, but for most of us here at Yahoo or other larger web companies, we're using multiple servers. So like on Apache, the inode is inserted into the e-tag syntax, and the inode for the exact same file with the exact same timestamp, the exact same size, the inode will not match on any two servers. So when the, when the browser says, oh, I have something cached, but the user hit reload, and I have to validate that with the web server, hey, I have this in my cache, is it the correct one to use? It will use this uh, if none match and pass the e-tag up to the web server. Well, if you don't hit the same web ser server you got it from with the exact same inode, the web server is going to say, no, it doesn't match. And it's going to download that whole content again, 10K of JavaScript or uh, 30K of image, whatever it is. So the point is, if you need some more flexible uh, behavior in how you generate uh, e-tags for identifying your resources, that's great. But if you're not going to use them, then you should turn them off. Because otherwise, they're, not, they're pr making things not as cacheable as they could be. And then the last rule is to make Ajax cacheable. Really what this talks about is applying the previous rules to your Ajax requests as well. But the main one is to make them cacheable. I think because Ajax requests are uh, dyna made dynamically, and a lot of times because they're personalized, People don't think that they should be cached by the browser. But a good example of this is, um, say I'm using a web-based email client, and it's downloading through an Ajax request my address book, so it can do auto-completion. So for me personally, I maybe edit my address book every week or two, but every time I go into that webmail client, it's going to make that Ajax request. And if the Ajax request doesn't have a far future expires header, it's going to download my 47K Yahoo address book every time. So uh, what instead you could do is you could, you could add something to the URL of that Ajax request that maybe is the last modified time that uh, the user has modified their address book. And if they haven't modified their address book, the URL will match what's in the cache, and the browser will read it from cache. But the next time the user modifies their address book, that modification time will change. And so the next time that that web server generates the email page, it will have a different URL for that address book, a different Ajax URL. And the Ajax request won't be read from cache. It'll be uh, done dynamically. OK, so that was the 14 rules. And everyone's still awake. OK, good. Uh, so really quick, I'm going to talk about case studies. I'm just going to talk about one. We've worked with a lot of properties inside Yahoo. Uh, kind of our poster child for performance is Yahoo Search. Uh, on the search results page, we've made all these changes to the page. 
um, that kind of go along with the 14 rules we just talked about. And in the case of uh, the Yahoo search results page, in the last year or so, it's cut the end user response time of the search result page by 40 to 50 percent. So this is really huge for a, a preeminent property like Yahoo Search to have this much of a reduction from the end user uh, perspective of their page loads times. It's really tremendous. Um, so we feel very strongly that uh, these rules, these best practices, uh, apply across uh, websites. So if you adopt them, you'll have faster pages. Uh, okay, so for like the last six months or so, I've been on an evangelism kick. Uh, I've got a book coming out uh, in just two weeks, uh, High Performance Websites, um, so order it now. Uh, talking at a lot of conferences, as I mentioned, this is the talk uh, that I gave at OzCon. Um, blogs, both uh, Tenny Toyer, the head of the Exceptional Performance Group, and myself write on these uh, different blogs on YUI and YDN. Uh, but one of the most exciting things, the biggest things that we've done for external evangelism is the release of YSlow. Um, so YSlow, get it? Why is my page slow? Um, YSlow, you can download it there. It's a performance lint tool. So it basically looks at your page and it compares it to these uh, best practices to see how well the page was built according to those best practices. Uh, and it generates a grade for each of the rules and then gives you an overall weighted grade for the page. And the um, version that we just released is an extension to Firebug, which itself is an extension to Firefox. So Firebug is kind of the preeminent tool among front-end engineers. And so having the YSlow logic built right there can tell front-end engineers really quickly things they can do to make the page even faster. And it's licensed under open source. So this is what it looks like. In a minute, I'll actually do a little live demo of YSlow. But I really quick wanted to show this. For these top 10 websites, the overall page weight, so that's the total uh, download size of all the components in the page, all the images and flash and everything else. How long it took, so this was measured over DSL. I measured it like 100 times. Um, and the YSlow grade. So what's kind of interesting is not too surprisingly, uh, the correlation, coefi correlation coefficient between response time and page weight is very, very high. So a quick stats review, uh, correlation coefficient can be between minus 1 and 1. Minus 1 means the two things are inversely co correlated. Uh, value of 1 means they're very highly correlated. 0 means there's no correlation. Anything 0.5 or higher is considered a strong correlation. So here, the correlation between response time and page weight is 0.94, very, very high. And that's not too surprising. It, it matches, right? If you have a page that's really, really bloated, it's probably going to be slow. But what is uh, kind of surprising or at least satisfying to me is the correlation between response time, which is what we're really trying to attack, and this YSlow grade. Because YSlow, when it analyzes a web page, it doesn't take into consideration at all the size of anything or how long anything takes to download. It just looks at how the page was built. What are the headers? Uh, you know, where were your uh, link tags and script tags in relation to other content in the page? And yet, even though it doesn't look at page weight or response time at all of anything in the page, it has a 0.76 correlation to response time. So even if you don't uh, have the ability to do response time testing on the pages you're building, at least not yet, maybe you're early in the development cycle. If you run YSlow on it, the YSlow grade is going to be a strong indicator of what the user is going to experience when you push that page out. So it's really good to try to get as good of a YSlow grade as you can. Okay, okay so where are the takeaways? Uh, of course, the number one rule, the golden performance golden rule, focus on this front end. It doesn't mean you should stop optimizing what you're doing in your Apache handlers or your back-end web server, but you got to also spend the right amount of time focusing on improving the performance of the front end. You'll probably have a bigger impact on the end user response time because there's more uh, low-hanging fruit there. Uh, and that's the follow-up to that is harvest that low-hanging fruit. There are usually easier changes and they'll have a bigger impact. And don't think that the response time is completely dependent on the user's hardware or uh, bandwidth speed. 
There's a lot of things that front-end developers can do when they build the page that are going to have huge reductions in uh, how long it takes for that page to load for the user. And a lot of these best practices are like, well, we'll get to that, we'll get to that. But if you do it now, it's not like you have to change the way that you do your work. It's just doing it differently. So I, I don't think, for example, uh, adding a query string or a version number to your components is that hard to do. Once you get that built into your build process, then for all the builds that come after that, you're going to benefit from having that done. So go ahead and take the time to make the, these small investments up front to get these best practices in place, and then you'll reap the benefits on an ongoing basis without any additional work. And Lofno, look out for number one. At Yahoo, the user is number one. And so uh, it's really up to us as the last gate before things get out to our users to hold the line. We've got to really be responsible for tracking uh, how fast our pages are. If they're not fast enough, stop and make them faster and figure out what it takes and put your foot down. Because if we don't do it, no one else is. And now's the time that we've got to adopt these best practices. As we're moving into Web 2.0, we're getting uh, more and more features and more and more content onto our pages. And we, with all that additional functionality and additional advanced ways of building web pages, we need to have uh, advanced ways of looking at performance and attacking performance. So adopting these rules will make your pages faster. And that's it. Thank you.